Hey there, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of The Dark Parade. I am your host, Bo, for these proceedings. And uh, we are wrapping up a month-long look at 80 slasher movies. And it's been a wonderful time. I've had <laughs> an excellent uh, sort of the tour back through some of the movies that I remember watching as I was younger, uh, enjoying them on a different level this time, digging deeper into the production of these movies and what these movies are about. And it's been a really fun time and I've, I've been lucky enough to have some great hosts for it. So uh, I hope that will uh, continue into next month, but we'll talk about that on the other end of this conversation, because even though we have reached the end of the line, it doesn't mean we're stopping. This is uh, uh, the episode I intentionally held back for the final one because it is my conversation with Jerry Cortez, aka Mr. Venom, who uh, helped start all of this with back-to-back uh, -back appearances when we talked about Psycho and Psycho 2 way back in the first episode of The Dark Parade. And he's uh, incredibly uh, articulate, he is uh, a, a wealth of knowledge about the, the process of filmmaking. He works in the industry himself, so he brings that expertise to it. And we just have a great time chatting. Uh, I am always, always, always bowled over when I have the opportunity to have him on. Uh, and I've resolved that we will do that more often because uh, he's just not on enough. So, uh, Hell Knight is a seminal movie for me. We talk about this a little bit on the show, but I, and I'll tell the story or I'll hold off on telling the story um, until you hear it there about how I wrote a version of Hell Knight, but that also happened. Um, the thing that uh, really fires my imagination about Hell Knight, I saw it w in a formative year. It's a movie that, uh, as, as you'll hear us discuss, isn't necessarily a great slasher movie, but it's a really significant slasher movie for me. And I really adore it on one hand. It also recognizes its flaws on the other, but we'll get into all that. We're, we're going to talk about how it was shot, uh, the, the circumstances of, of why certain elements of the movie were uh, a little shoddier and some are better and the actors and all that stuff. We give Hell Knight its day in court, for sure. Or night in court, uh, as the case may be. But uh, anyway, enough out of me. Let's get to the conversation, because I'm just going to keep telling you how uh, we talked about all this fun stuff. Uh, I'll shut up. Here's all the fun stuff we talked about. Here's me and Jerry talking about Hell Knight. I'll see you on the other side. All right, folks. Uh, as, as threatened, as warned, as prophesied, I'm back again with uh, the guy who kind of started all of this off, and it's crazy that we haven't done a show together since then, um, or at least not a, a Dark Parade, but it's Mr. Venom himself, Jerry Cortez. Uh, what is up, man? Greetings and salutations, my friend. Yeah, doing doing really, really well and really happy to be with you again. Uh, we haven't worked together since uh, you guessed it on one of my shows uh, a couple of months ago when we talked about 1954's Them. Right. And uh, so, yeah, this is a long time coming, my friend. And that went so badly that we just <laughs> refused to record for a while until the dust had settled. Um, no, that was really fun. And, and I think I'm coming back pretty soon. That's what I hear. That is yeah. the rumor. Yeah, I just found out today, so that's exciting. That is exciting because it's a movie that I have a lot of fondness for, probably inappropriately. <laughs> um, so, uh, but we'll, te we'll tease that later on. Yep. Um, first of all, to get this piece of it out of the way, if occasionally I lose consciousness during this recording, the reason is that uh, I was walking my dog the other day. And before I could stop him, he ate an entire baby rabbit carcass. Yikes. I know. And <laughs> is currently apparently processing this thing, which has resulted in s some rubber tire gas coming out of this dog. Mm. That is some of the worst 
or aromas I've ever smelled in my entire life. And earlier today, this has nothing to do with anything. It's just a story I want to tell. So earlier today, I'm taking the dog for a walk again. And now I'm on high alert because my stupid dog will eat anything. Mm. And I don't want to reap the whirlwind that comes the gastrointestinal whirlwind that that this is going to create and this stupid dog i have to yank him away from trying to eat just a smush squirrel on the road (laughs) and i think what i've learned is that he's just an adventurous eater as most uh canines probably are yeah yeah it's it's taken some getting used to i've been a cat guy for a long time and having a dog it's a it's a different world uh, of just random crap that they will eat. Like every now and again, I'll just see him chewing on something. I realize, like, oh, he's just eating a thumbtack like an idiot. Oh, geez. you're right. <laughs> I'm like, oh my goodness, that the fact that this dog has made it this far is a shock. It's like it's like having an infant, I presume. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't have one of those, but I got a real dumb dog. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So that has nothing to do with Hell Knight, but uh, I, I felt oh, like... Hell Knight for your dog, anyway, maybe, or Hell Knight for you having to deal with it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's certainly a stinky night. Um, so I always like to start this <laughs> with not just dog stories, but also is sort of your first encounter with the movie Hell Knight. Like, when when did you run across this little bit of '80s wonderfulness? Well, this is one of the few theatrical early 80s slashers that I did not see in theaters. Um, Obviously, I was very young, well under the appropriate age for these movies. But I had some older cousins back then, females actually, uh, some female older cousins that would take me with them to go see things like My Bloody Valentine, Hell Night, Friday the 13th Part 2, things like that. So I actually, I got a pretty good uh, theatrical horror education early on. But this one, unfortunately, I did not get a chance to see in theaters. But I did watch it the following year when it got its VHS release. So it would have been sometime in 82. I would have watched it with those same cousins because they they are a big part of... uh, making me who I am today as far as the horror fan and cinephile. I mean, they they kind of indoctrinated me with that, along with my parents and other members of my family. But when it came to horror specifically, it was these uh, two female cousins that kind of turned me on to most of the great stuff, you know, from the late 70s and early 80s. So, so yeah, 1982 VHS released. Uh, I, I would have been one of the first to rent this from my local video store waiting for it to come out. After hearing the stories some people were talking about. And plus, it it stars my first horror crush in Linda Blair. So it was a no-brainer that I was going to be renting this right away. And absolutely loved it. Adored it from first watch. Um, Obviously, my eyes are a little bit more mature uh, as uh, the years have gone on. So my opinion hasn't drastically changed on the movie so much as I can be objective with judging certain parts of it. Whereas when I was 12 years old, it was just, this movie is fucking awesome, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. (laughs) Now I can dissect it a little bit more, um, you know, adaptly now, adeptly now, excuse me. And, um, you know, I can can see its flaws. I can see why maybe it's not, you know, the classic that I feel it should be. But I mean, this is... (laughs) This is the sheer definition of a guilty pleasure for me. I, I, I've loved this movie from day one, and even watching it again this week, it just reminded me how, A, imperfect the film is, and B, how much I love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you. And I saw it real early as well. It's got such a great cover, or the, the VHS, yeah. and the, the poster as well. It's, it's an incredible horror poster. Yeah, it really is. Really nice oil painting. Yeah, I, I loved it. Yeah, which if you haven't seen it, ladies and jelly spoons, you should absolutely uh, Google or Bing or whatever it is that you deviants do to find images of things. <laughs> Go to DeviantArt and type in Hell Knight. And there's, there, it, it's like you said, it's kind of this oil painting of Linda Blair on the <laughs> gates of uh, Garth Manor. And, oh, it's so good. And Mm -hmm. I saw this when I was, again, too young. I think you and I are very similar in a lot of ways. 
and one of those ways is that nobody was at the wheel in terms of what we were watching. <laughs> <laughs> nobody was intervening and, and trying to make good decisions. So, uh, and weirdly, I had a cousin. She didn't show me Hell Knight, but when I was uh, 11, I want to say, whenever Gremlin, Gremlins came out, she took me to see Gremlins. Mm-hmm. Which at the time, you know, is a P- PG-13 movie, I think, or one of the movies that in- inspired PG-13. And, mm-hmm. uh, and I was probably... Uh, if not too young for Gremlin, certainly on the on the cusp of that. And yeah, but she didn't care. Amy Beth didn't give a damn. She was she was she was happy to have somebody to come along who was like, "Oh my god, those puppets are great." Um, but yeah, so I saw Hell Knight pretty early on. I was at least fifth or sixth grade. I I would have seen this by, and the reason I know that is because right around sixth grade. I was in a class where I had a creative writing assignment and one of the first things I ever wrote creatively and, uh, you know, the, in a not not necessarily illustrious career, but a semi-professional <laughs> career of writing, uh, you know, I've written screenplays and books and all kinds of stuff. One of the very first things that I've, I ever wrote was a sequel to Hell Knight for this class. And or not even a sequel. I take that back. It was a novelization. Only it was like you know three pages long. So it was a pretty thin novelization. But it was that. It was like I was so captured uh, by Hell Knight that I was like, I need to put this on paper and share it with the world. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I have a lot of fondness for this movie because it was, it was one of the probably one of the first slashers I ever really responded to. Hmm. Um, which is strange because, I mean, Halloween for sure. I had seen Halloween prior to Hell Knight and I, I loved that movie. But there were a lot of slashers that came along that I wasn't really that captivated by. But Hell Knight was a different kind of animal. Uh, I really liked it. I think, in retrospect, it's because it traffics in a lot of very classic tropes. Uh, like, you know, here's the uh, the mansion that's been abandoned, and uh, there, there's almost this sort of Lovecraftian kind of vibe to it. Not the cosmic horror stuff, but the other side of Lovecraft, which is just all about, you know, families inbreeding to the point that they're living in the basement and producing horrific offspring. Like, uh, what, the thing at the doorstep, that kind of Lovecraft. Sure. And, yeah, I think it's really kind of wonderful. Um, but, but it's not, I mean, we'll get into this. I don't think it's a great movie. It just means a lot to me. Exactly. I, oh, that's exactly how I explain it to people. I would, I would never, ever say that this is a good movie or even try to convince anyone that this is a quote unquote good movie. But it's just, if you watch it at the right time and you got the right mindset going into it and it resonates with you, it turns into an instant classic, which is exactly what it did with me. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, so the movie com- comes out in 1981. It was re- originally released on August 7th. I think uh, a couple of weeks later, it, it was widely released. Um, the movie cost about a million and a half dollars, went a little bit over budget in its production. It was originally a million dollar movie and then uh, it turned out that some reshooting needed to be done and you know so rounded out about 1.4 1.5 million um, domestically made about 2.3 million so a moderate success and then once you fig- figure in over the years all the VHS rentals and DVD purchases and Blu-ray purchases and that kind of thing like Hell Knight really found itself on home video, I believe. Mm-hmm. And yeah, for the most part, uh, it, I mean, if I remember correctly, for the most part, the critics were not favorable with Hell Knight. But I do remember reading some reviews in '81 and '82, where surprisingly, some critics actually enjoyed it. Actually, said that it was a, a much better film than it deserved to be. I think uh, was the exact quote. Um, but yeah, most critics still kind of you know panned it when it came out. 
Yeah, and I don't know that that's wrong. <laughs> uh, but again, there there are elements of this movie that I think set it apart from, you know, uh, I was going to say Slumber Party Massacre or something like that, but, you know, th- that's probably unfair. It's <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's kind of an interesting movie. But, uh, but you know, the, the, the kind of, you know... Uh, the spawn of Friday the 13th and Halloween and all, and all of that. Uh, and we've talked about a number of slashers this, this month on, on dark parade. Like we've talked about April fool's day and happy birthday, uh, to me and, um, hell night. And, you know, all these movies that I think are kind of unusual in the slasher genre. And I think what I've learned about myself in, in discussing all of these movies is that I don't necessarily like the standard formula slasher, but I like movies that play around with, with the tropes. And mm-hmm. and even in 81, like this is only a handful of years after Halloween, only a year after Friday the 13th, um, that you really get, uh, you know, a, 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 that wave of, of movies kind of capitalizing on those films. Um, but this has a little bit of panache and, um, yeah. Now this movie definitely has a style that most eighties low budget slashers couldn't duplicate. The mere fact that they were able to film on location at a mansion, um, at least for the exterior stuff, Mm -hmm. uh, just kind of elevates the movie a little bit. Um, obviously having Linda Blair in there, you know, obviously, you know, coming off an Oscar nominated, per- well, not coming off of, but, you know, years after an Oscar nominated performance from her, that's going to add a little bit of more credibility to it. So, yeah, I remember going into this being really excited, um, mainly for those reasons. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, well, let, let's get into the story of this thing and and we'll try to keep it reasonably snappy because I don't think we're going to have like a psycho level no. discussion of like scene by scene let's talk about you know the the, yeah. the owl imagery of hell night um <laughs> we're not going to talk about classism in hell night no <laughs> right right not not the deepest film what might say uh, no. but it it so you you kind of open up on a, a big uh sorority row kind of party in the streets it's in the typical 80s like there's toilet paper in the trees and everybody's drunk out in the roads it's you know mass hysteria (laughs) and we are introduced to uh peter bennett who is the head of this uh fraternity alpha sigma rho is the fraternity and it basically is telling uh the crowd assembled there like hey we've got these four pledges we're gonna make them stay in garth manor until dawn on hell night as part of their initiation yep. and so in very short order we have an entire parade of people that go to garth manor <laughs> uh and i like the fact that this movie gets off the ground pretty fast it's like no screwing around we'll we'll introduce all the characters on the back end and there's uh marty who is linda blair there is sort of her paramour uh, Jeff as played by Peter Barton there is Denise as played by Suki Goodwin who only ever did this and maybe one other thing which seems kind of crazy to me because all the other movies like you know we've talked about April Fool's Day and My Bloody Valentine and movies like that this month and those casts went on to do a lot of work some of them a lot of them still working today and the fact that Suki Goodwin was kind of you know one and done blew blew my mind a little bit and yeah, then literally one and done yeah she, this was her only film she did one other tv series that was it yeah that's nuts to me but but based on the commentary and some of the the stories it sounded like she didn't necessarily have a great time shooting no. this that you know despite the fact that i think she's pretty good as kind of the sex pot in the movie that (laughs) that just wasn't her thing like she i don't think she was very comfortable doing any of that stuff by the sound of it no not at all i mean from what i understand the role did call for some nudity and she absolutely refused 
no no nudity and no simulated sex which explains the uh subpar let's say love scene between uh her and vince van patten but we'll get to that yeah yeah uh so and then vince van patten is, is her would-be boyfriend seb who is is one of those faces that feels like he popped up everywhere in the 80s <laughs> what's funny is that i'm a i'm a hardcore poker fan so i've been watching vince van patten as the host on the world poker tour for almost 20 seasons now i think they're up to like season 18 or something like that and he's been he's been a co-host on that show the entire run so no going kidding. back yeah going back to this and seeing young vince van patten here especially here where he's still um he's still a tennis pro at this point in his life so he's obviously in shape you know we see that he's in really good shape and everything and I only knew his tennis uh, from the stories that he told on the World Poker Tour. So, so to see him this young um, was definitely uh, kind of a little jarring to me, if you will. Just because I'm used to, like, the older, more debonair Vince Van Patten. You know, he wears a suit, you know, when, when he's hosting this show. He talks very eloquently, things like that. He's definitely not the surfer that we see in this movie. Yeah, but I think he was... Uh, actually a server is yes. my understanding so and in fact uh, they kind of rewrote that scene to lean into the fact that you know he, he knew what he was talking about and had mm -hmm. uh, some experience along those lines but um, yeah so anyway these four knuckleheads <laughs> are, are being <laughs> taken by uh, uh, Peter Bennett the uh, the fraternity president and his Guy Friday uh, Scott as played by Jimmy Sturdivant and they are uh, going to spend the night at Garth Manor. Um, he basically unlocks this, you know, old school cask of Amontillado style padlock <laughs> and opens up the gates and leads them inside. It, it lead, or leads them inside. It, it's kind of a uh, an Aaron Sorkin style walk and talk. <laughs> <laughs> He's taking them to the mansion. And it's this giant monologue where he's like, okay, here's what happened. There was uh, the owner of this place who was the great-grandson of a gold prospector named Raymond Garth. And he strangled his wife to death and then murdered three of his children because they were all incredibly deformed. And then afterwards, he hanged himself, but they never found the body of the youngest child, Andrew. And so or the dad, apparently, because um, when he tells the story, he says that Andrew killed his wife, two of his kids, and then killed himself. But then he says the police only found three bodies. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It's almost like a throwaway line. Like if you're not paying attention to it, you might miss it. But yeah, it's almost like giving you the hint right there of what's about to happen. It's kind of cool. Yeah. <laughs> it, the, the movie does a nice job of sort of setting up the ending of the movie pretty well, including the things like, you know, the fact that this guy Peter's got the keys to this place, which factors in a couple of times in the course of the movie. And um, anyway, so, yeah, uh, the the kid watched these murders take place and the legend is he's living somewhere in Garth Manor and that's you know the ghost story the town ghost story that they tell one another and so you know he says look there's no there's no electricity there's no phones you're just gonna go inside spend the night and meanwhile Peter and his buddy Scott are setting about to scare the hell out of the the pledges you know they've got you know all kinds of mannequins and one-way mirrors and all kinds of crazy stuff designed to to freak them out um and so uh there's also a lady named may who is along uh that you know kind of showed up at the beginning of the movie um and she is the first to be killed uh, as yeah, she's and, off wandering around. Yeah, and a kill that we'll never see. Yeah, yeah, it's a, a real off off the screen kind of thing. Like, it's... Uh, is that where the stone opens up? 
Uh, just yeah, just uh, just before that is when they open up the stone and go in. Yeah. Yeah. So but the, the the story of this kill is basically um, they shot a much more elaborate decapitation that we'll never see because they lost the footage. Even in a two in a 2017 interview with uh, Tom De Simone, he actually says he doesn't know where the footage is and he's very upset about it. That he literally it would have been the best kill in the film. Um, that they could have put on, like, the DVD release or something like that. But someone lost the elements, so it's gone forever. But, yeah, they actually had... It was going to be kind of like... Because um, they knew they wanted to do a decapitation going into it. But, obviously, you know, this is the year after one of horror's most famous decapitations in the original Friday the 13th. So they didn't want to do a standard decap like we've seen before. So what they decided they wanted to do was actually have um, Andrew Garth, the killer actually holding her head up and then so that he could decapitate her and her body would fall to the ground. Um, apparently they shot it two or three times. Uh, the director was incredibly happy with it. Um, but obviously the producers basically, once they saw it said, there's no way we'll let you put that in the movie. We're not going to get a, an R rating if you put that in there. So yeah, so that footage is gone forever. But according to the director, it was a spectacularly well uh, shot scene that looked awesome and we'll never see it. You know, this is why I like having you here. Not just because <laughs> you can disappoint us all. Uh, oh, with this yeah. Story. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but I, uh, the more packed with trivia this episode is, the happier I'm going to be. So, uh, yeah. So after this girl, May, gets it, um, there is uh, uh, Scott who climbs up to the roof because he's going to hang this dummy. And this is actually, it's a real easy, you know, camera trick or editing trick, really. But when he gets killed, it's basically Andrew Garth popping up and grabbing his head and twisting it. And it's just a quick edit where you see Scott from the front and then his head is turned. But as the turn is happening, you cut to the reverse shot and it's him with his clothes on backwards, you know, <laughs> just turning his head and spitting out a little blood. But I really like it. I think it really works. It's, hey, it's effective. That's all that matters. <laughs> yeah, it's really fun. And uh, then Peter is going to check on his buddy Scott, um, you know, because naturally he's like, hey, where is this knucklehead that is supposed to be doing all my work for me? And discovers that, oh, there's... He goes up to the roof and finds that the dummy is not suspended on the wire. So he starts pulling up the wire to see what's on the other end of it. And uh, I thought this was interesting. That when they originally shot it, you couldn't tell that the wire was moving. And so hmm. they painted uh, the wire different colors intermittently so that you could actually see the motion of the wire being drawn back in. <laughs> and uh, again, just one of those things that I'm sure nobody thought about until they were, you know, looking through the camera on set and realized like, oh, it doesn't look like he's actually pulling anything up. Uh, but sure enough, he pulls up uh, his, his friend Scott. <laughs> and Peter, not being what you would call a benevolent character in the movie, decides to hell with everybody else I'm getting out of here but he decides to cut through a shining style hedge maze <laughs> uh, which had to be brought in like that didn't actually exist in nope. the manner so that yeah they had to basically bring it in and make it and based on the way they described it it was they would shoot like this scene with Peter running through this maze. And then when that scene was done, they would be like, all right, Linda Blair, uh, your turn. And they would just bring her in and then run her through the maze. And so they could shoot all of that stuff at the same time, which, you know, that's how you make a movie. But I, I do think it's kind of funny that they were just lining them up and like, all right, run. <laughs> Uh, but we do see that Peter is then uh, murdered by uh, a, a killer 
who impales him with a, a like a garden scythe, and and that's also kind of when we realize, oh, hey, there is more than one person doing hmm. business. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, that, that's all going on outside. But let's get inside to our main characters who um, are kind of pairing off. Like uh, you know, the the inside is all lit by candles there are cobwebs draped everywhere it's uh you know this giant victorian style um kind of interior which as you pointed out earlier was different than the exterior the, the, all this stuff was not shot um at the uh i can't remember the name of the mansion now but anyway it was uh, kimberly crest yeah kimberly crest mansion um which they were allowed to shoot on the roof and they were allowed to shoot in the yard and all over the grounds. No, they... actually, they were not allowed to shoot on the roof. The owners told them that for insurance purposes, they could not let them up there. Uh, so the, the roof is actually a set that they built in Glendale, California. Oh, no kidding. I thought they were on the roof of that thing. Okay. Yeah, uh, they were on a roof, but not the <laughs> roof. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, all the interiors, though, are, are basically a much more modern house but it like you know still a very yeah a, a very uh extravagant home in la yeah it's a, this is probably one of my bigger complaints about the set design of this movie is that the exterior shots are just gorgeous like kimberly crest is an amazing property not just the house but all the land around it like this movie doesn't actually give you a good idea of how much property there is because they, they make it seem when you know when watching the film that like you could run from the front uh door to the gate whereas in reality the the gate is actually a full mile away from the front door of the manor so they actually had to do a lot of like fancy camera work and and relighting areas uh different ways so that it made it look like the gate was actually near the house but I, i've actually been to kimberly crest um it's in redlands california uh i forget the actual street it was on damn it prospect drive it's on prospect drive in redlands california uh about 21 or so years ago i actually dated a girl uh, very briefly from redlands and uh yeah uh, she uh, she knew of it not from the movie but she just knew of because it's a, it's a, it's actually a landmark um, it's a protected landmark in Redlands now and was back then as well even when it was a private residence but uh, yeah I mean it takes almost half a day to take the full tour it, it is a gigantic property uh, probably a good I don't know 20 25 acres it, it's a it's a lot of land and this is the only movie to have been shot there. I think yes because after this movie was shot the owners actually moved they sold the property and moved and right after uh the production of the film right after the sale of the home um the city of redlands turned it into a uh, museum so now the house is a museum but the property outside can be rented for like events like weddings and receptions and whatnot but the inside is a museum huh uh yeah i thought i had that right but that's it's a fascinating house you know it looks great uh it reminds me a little bit even though the this is certainly more gothic looking than um but I, i'm thinking of steve miner's house like the house from house yeah <laughs> uh but you know that's a much more modest kind of home but they both have this feel like the exteriors are like well that house just looks spooky mm -hmm. you know um <laughs> and i i man yeah, a set goes so such a long way towards setting the mood and creating the atmosphere and I think this movie is actually shot pretty well as well, as well. Es sure. especially the exteriors though it's it's really well done I didn't realize that the gate was that far away that's again some yeah delicious movie magic Oh, and for more trivia uh, for you, uh, that gate did not exist when they started uh, making the film. They had to build that gate for the movie. Oh, that's great. Oh, I love <laughs> stuff like that so much. So, yeah, all right. So inside the not Garth Manor, but is Garth Manor. You get it. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> they uh, start to run into some of the pranks set up by Peter and Scott before, you know, they were murdered horribly which is a lot of screaming and they find some speakers and uh poor linda blair at one point is is beset by 
a ghost um, that is <laughs> zombie ghost. The zombie ghost coming at her, and the the poor guy who played the zombie ghost died what, before the movie got released. I think. Yeah, he also played uh, Andrew uh, Garth. Yeah. So yeah, he yeah, so, yeah. I mean, he and he doesn't even get a credit like on IMDb. Like it, 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 it's actually a little bit of a hunt to find that guy's name. But yeah, um, he passed away from a car accident before the movie was released. Yeah, that's a real shame. He did a fine job, but um, yeah. So uh, Seth and Denise, aka Vince Van Patten and Suki Goodwin decide that they're gonna go uh do some quaaludes and booze and have some sexy time and uh, which is uh, the pg version of sexy time i guess yeah i mean it's all done in silhouette but i'm you know when we were doing lost after dark there was uh, we had the discussion with the producers about like hey if we're gonna do kind of an 80s style slasher movie should we have some nudity and I have to admit, I like this is all my fault for people who saw that movie and, and were like, "Why are there tits?" That's <laughs> that's my fault, um, and it's because I was like, I don't want to make some you know poor twenty year old actress or you know twenty two, twenty three, whatever, at the beginning of an acting career, make uh, or have to do a scene where you know she she's going topless because in the age of the internet that shit lives forever and it's not just like oh if you can get your hands on a copy of this movie you can see so and so's boobs it that's it's out there it is forever and if they go on to have a career doing other stuff it it may haunt them and also it just feels a little exploitative and blah 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 in in modern context like i'm not i'm not giving 80s movies a hard time because that was the time but uh that by that same token though there is a scene with two girls making out because the producers like, were like, well, if we're not going to have nudity, we got to have something sexy. <laughs> so that is why there is not nudity, but there is a lesbian kiss in it. Mm-hmm. You know, just a little... And some shadowy sex play. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, but yeah, so Hell Knight does the, you know, the silhouette, and, but it's... I don't have a problem with it because, you know, you're seeing the legs, you know, up in the air and you kind of see her in profile and that kind of thing. And although if you listen to the director and star commentary and that kind of thing, I feel like their conversation is a a bit prudish about it. (laughs) Um, Where they're like, you just don't need it. It just takes away from the movie and and so forth. And I'm like, eh, I don't know about that because, you know these are two young people who are doing a lot of drugs and and just having a good time so i'm not knee-jerk against nudity in that situation that makes some sense but um but anyway so they they seth does this whole bit about surfing and you know squats on top of her for a while it's it's all very silly and uh but then they yeah then they have sex he goes to the bathroom um and she gets grabbed by you know a deformed person and so seth comes back to bed he and it's a very godfather kind of thing where he slips into bed is like what what's this throws back (laughs) the blanket and it's not uh denise it's may the the girl that he he doesn't even know who she is really but just finds a severed head in the bed with him and he remembers her from the party because he does mention uh, i think he actually says that sorority bitch or something like that his he he recognizes her but he doesn't doesn't, like personally know her he has a great scream there yeah yeah. (laughs) that's funny my wife and i laughed our asses off at that scream (laughs) it's a good scream you know, I mean, it's very high pitched. It's it. One might go so far as to call it a girlish scream, mm-hmm. but it a hundred percent is like it, a lot. It's better than a you know the typical. Ah! It's it's really uh, it comes from the the duodenum, and so he he runs downstairs, tells everybody like, oh my god, there's a a head there. We got to get out of here. Denise is missing. And so 
they all run to the gate to try to go out and get help, but of course, there are no keys. And so Seth decides, well, I'm going to climb this fence, even though it's got apparently razor sharp spikes at the top of it. <laughs> Great judgment. You know, in a situation like this, I don't hold it against Seth. No, no, honestly, you're right. I mean, I would probably, I mean, well, I mean, not my fat ass, but I mean, if I were in shape, I would probably attempt it too in that situation. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, what's, a, what's a couple of, you know, scratches and cuts to, to get out of there alive, you know? Yeah, even with not being in shape, even a little bit, I'd at least give it a <laughs> shot. I, like, I wouldn't make it very far and I'd make everybody else, like, look away just out of, you know, shame. Uh, like, we can't watch this. Holy shit. Can you, he's not even getting halfway up there. This is embarrassing. Why, why didn't he just uh, yeah, go around? I'm, I'm the idiot that would fight. You know, I, I am <laughs> I'm too big and old to run from anything. So, yeah, if I see Andrew Garth coming at me, I'm the kind of idiot that's going to sit there and try to fight him and, and then probably get my head punched off my shoulders. Whatever. You know? <laughs> right. A real Jason <laughs> takes Manhattan move where there you go. just one punch <laughs> and off goes the noggin. Um, uh, yeah, I don't... Yeah, I don't have those kind of smarts. I would do the, the Seth scream. <laughs> and then I would just run until I had a heart attack. He would, uh, he would, they'd never lay a hand on me. <laughs> 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 so, uh, but sure enough, Seth gets over the feds. He like cuts his, his arm uh, trying to get over as well as his hands. But he does make it over. And he says, hey, I'm going to come back for you guys. Because Linda Blair, you know, in, in sort of a... a reference to the cover or well the cover is kind of taken from this scene but it's her trying to scale the fence as well and she's just not going anywhere uh weighed down by her boobs no doubt and uh so he's just like hey i'll, I'll i'm gonna go get help and then i'll come back and so off goes seth and jeff and marty decide well we're gonna have to go back inside and just kind of hunker down until he comes back uh for with help and so Seth goes to one of the frat houses, banks on the door, gets no luck there. So he has to take off uh, for town, uh, one presumes. Um, and meanwhile, Jeff and Marty discover, like, they hear some tapping and realize, like, oh, here's the body of this dude, Scott. And they hear um, a, a scream. And so, is that right? Is it a scream that draws Jeff out? Because he's like, hey, we've, we've got to go look for Denise. And, yeah, I believe so, yes. And so there, he's going to leave Linda Blair behind and go back into this hedge maze, which is what happens. And he finds the, the corpse of the fraternity present, Peter, uh, impaled on the wall of this hedge maze and <laughs> eagle-eyed fans will notice that apparently andrew garth um pulled the sickle out or the scythe pulled the scythe out and then put it back in a different direction to prop the body up because right. the sickle's in a different position than it was when he got killed right put it back <laughs> the other way yeah exactly <laughs> and so he runs off but the camera does the little uh, lingering onto the hand of uh, of Peter so that we see, like, oh, he, they're right in his hand are the keys to the gate, and they could get away, but he was too panicked. And so he runs back to the house to tell Marty, like, oh, everybody else is dead. It's got to be that crazy, deformed Andrew Garth, who is referred to by Peter earlier as, like, is it Gorped? Uh, uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah. You're right. It's some weird word like that. Bork or dork or gork or something like that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which is his shorthand for, you know, they've got, you know, mutations and uh, developmental disorders <laughs> and that kind of thing. Yeah. But he uses the word a number of times. It's really striking. And nobody else really, at, like, at one point they're like, is the, uh, do you think this is one of those Gort kids? And they're like, yeah, I guess it is. Um, <laughs> now that you say that, that makes a lot of sense. So, uh, 
Jeff grabs a pitchfork, and so he and Marty just kind of hang out in a bedroom with this pitchfork, waiting for Seth to come back with help. But one of the things I really like about this movie as a whole is that our villains kind of have not just, you know, the tunnels we'll get to under under the house, but just have little hidey holes all over the place. Mm-hmm. And in this case, it's uh, one of them g- coming up from the floor under a rug. <laughs> you know, just put, <laughs> put a rug over the hole. And I'm sure that was uh, the director's homage to Michael Myers under the bed sheet. Sure, yeah. It he he comes up and he's gonna grab uh, Marty. Jeff ends up stabbing him with a pitchfork, and he just goes back through the hole in the floor. And and Jeff stupidly is like, "Well, let's go get him." And it's like, <laughs> "Come on, man!" Like. From from a logistical point of view, he's got the pitchfork now. Yeah, I mean, granted, it's sticking out of him, but still. Yeah. And it's funny, too, because it, he, he makes the justification to go after him um, to Marty. He basically says, well, he knows this house better than we do. And I'm thinking to myself, wouldn't that be a reason to stay put? Because he knows the house better than you? He's just going to be waiting for you around the first dark corner. Yeah. Yeah. That was odd. It, it's a fine point and one that Linda Blair who is the more rational of the two in this uh, in, in this movie should have been quick to point out but anyway it, instead she's like well if you're going then I'm going with you <laughs> and so they they end up going into a bunch of underground tunnels and I think this is really the point when I saw it as a kid that fired my imagination and this even though it turns out it's really just a set that mm-hmm. they keep like just all right we're gonna reverse the shot now you run through all right now we're gonna take a slightly different angle now you come through um, <laughs> it's all just one thing but it still looks really cool and and there's something about a house with you know this series of tunnels under it that that I really did oh yeah and they do a uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre style discovery of a, a, a table full of decomposing bodies, including Denise is in there and some old corpses and all kinds of stuff. I assume that's the family that was murdered the year before in the story, though why the bodies are still there is beyond me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know. It, it could medical... be random bodies too, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> right. Uh, just squatters. <laughs> that decided to use the the Garth Mansion as their home, uh, yeah. vacationing kids, whatever. But <laughs> uh, yeah, so they're obviously freaked out by this display, and then they see Andrew Garth coming towards them, and there's a chase through the tunnels, and there's a big fight. Jeff gets knocked down some stairs, and he gets his leg injured, and then he and uh, Linda Blair escape though because there's like a, a hidden exit that they find so they get out and meanwhile in another part of the movie Seth makes it to the police station and uh, the police are fed up with fraternity pranks on this evening it's, it's got kind of a black Christmas vibe where they're like the cops just aren't having it yeah the worst some of the worst cinematic cops ever yeah, yeah. This guy shows up bloody, desperate, panting, and they're like, "Oh boy, here's another one." <laughs> and they they think that he's you know pulling a prank, and so uh, and they're gonna throw him in jail for the night. They just to get him off the streets, one presumes, and he decides instead that he's going to steal a shotgun off a table full of weapons that they have handy (laughs) in an unlocked room. How convenient. Yeah. (laughs) And then he goes out the window. So, you know, now he's the, the one thing that the police station was good for was giving him weapons. (laughs) 
and so Seth grabs the shotgun, goes out the window, and and is uh, on his way back to Garth Manor, thinks to do some carjacking. Yeah, probably the first cinematic carjacking ever. Maybe so, <laughs> yeah. I, is that... I wonder if it I don't was... know. I, I, I didn't... I didn't necessarily hear anything about it, but I had never heard the term carjack until the late 80s growing up. So this is 81. I don't think it was a term yet. I'm not going to sit, I'd literally sit here and say that it's the first one. It is the first one in, that I can think of in films, but I, I'm sure I haven't seen every movie ever made either. So Yeah, though we need to do a scientific study of this. But yeah, it's, but it's definitely <laughs> early carjacking of this desperate college kid with a shotgun just being like, yeah. give me your car. This is why I call these cops, uh, the cops in this town, the worst. Because even if you don't believe a, dr a drunk college kid, the guy that he carjacked was a middle-aged suit and tie guy. That guy had to have called the police or, it, obviously this is before the days of cell phones, so he probably would have had to have found a pay phone or knocked at somebody's door. But the point is, when this kind of, when this type of individual, at least in the early 80s, you know, a white man, you know, middle-aged, fairly well-dressed in a suit and tie, when he walks in and says he got carjacked, the cops are going to take it seriously. So right. why do the cops never, and, and on top of the fact that Seth even tells them, he tells the guy that he's jacking, oh, fine, call the cops and let them know we'll be at Garth Manor. And they still never show up. It's like, I, hmm, yeah. I don't know. I, I question the... Uh, that or maybe that suit and tie guy just didn't call the cops or maybe he's still walking to the police station today i don't know the thing we don't know is there's a truck full of cocaine <laughs> that he, he absolutely cannot go to the police about <laughs> hmm. Hmm. interesting so that uh that was in my novelization i you know, i was fixing some like plot it. holes along the way um uh, and yeah, the police are too busy trying to get at the bottom of who sold the shotgun. Probably, <laughs> <laughs> got a got a bolo out on the shotgun. Not worried about the kid. Yeah. And you'd think the guy, the suit and tie guy, would have told them, "Yeah, the kid had a shotgun." Hmm. Two plus two? Maybe? Yeah. No. Okay. Huh, can you describe <laughs> the shotgun? Maybe it's the one we're looking for. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. And. Anyway, so Seth takes his stolen car and stolen shotgun back to Garth Manor, where he sees, um, th like, a, a figure kind of run past him, and he, he follows along with his shotgun, finds a bar uh, of the fence kind of bent out of place, and so he gets back into the manor that way. And he gets attacked by a dude and they're fighting back and forth and then in in what you presume is going to be the last moments of the movie and isn't quite he shoots this guy with the shotgun and blows him into the fountain mm -hmm. and then he you know the guy gets back up for a second he shoots him again and so <laughs> He runs back into the banner. He's like, hey, Jeff, Marty, good news. I killed the guy that was, you know, after us. He is now floating in a pool of his own blood and, you know, soupy water in this fountain that hasn't run for years. And uh, Jeff and Marty are, you know, thrilled to hear it. They're like, that's great. We'll be down in a second. <laughs> But unfortunately, before they could do that, uh, Seth gets grabbed by our other killer and mm -hmm. is... Daddy. It, right. And is dragged off. And you hear... You hear a gunshot. And then it's quiet for a second. And then the shotgun just goes sliding across the floor. And there's silence. And Linda Blair is like, I'm going to go get the gun. And Jeff's like, no, 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 don't do it. It's a, it's a trap. And she's like, I don't care. I'm going to go get that gun. And so she kind of creeps down the steps, goes for the gun. Killer leaps out. She gets out of his grasp, uh, runs back upstairs to the bedroom. And then Papa Garth then grabs Jeff and throws him the hell out of a window. <laughs> which is pretty fun. It's not a great slasher death, 
but anybody getting thrown out of a window. I'm a big fan in general of the word defenestration. <laughs> and, and seeing it on screen always makes me happy. Uh, that probably says something about me, and I'll bring it up with my therapist. <laughs> But Marty ends up going out of the house through this hedge maze where she finds Peter. And as she's freaking out about that, his body falls on top of her. Uh, and then she realizes, like, oh, shit, the keys. And has to pry him from his cold, dead hands like it was a gun from Charles Charlton Heston's hands. <laughs> and so she goes to the gate, unlocks it finds the car outside but there are no keys so she has to hotwire it and which was established earlier in the movie that you know she's a mechanic and so forth mm -hmm. grew up in a family of mechanics so she hotwires the car starts driving away uh, backs into the fence which angles it down and then as she's backing up Papa Garth jumps on the hood of the car and is it Papa Garth or Andrew Garth? Andrew Garth is the one who's dead, right? No, Morris Garth is the son who was killed so Andrew Garth is the dead. Okay, so sorry, Andrew Garth is the one on the car. Morris yep, Garth is Yep, he's the dead. giant. Yeah, exactly. So, she ends up uh, basically ramming him into the broken fence that that has the spikes angled at her it's a very like hammer dracula kind of murder yes which i also really appreciate yeah and then there is an absolutely fantastic death throw from our papa garth who mm -hmm. coughs up blood and chokes and makes the, the most hideous noises and and then dies and so at, at, you know kind of there into the movie, the movie there's a shot of like the sun starts coming up Linda Blair gets out of the car realizing that it's no longer drivable and just starts walking back towards town as you know credits start rolling and she cries yeah still no cops <laughs> no no but it's the next damn morning and these cops have, still haven't showed up you know, they're like, eh, we'll send somebody by after shift change. Uh, that poor suit and tie guy is still sitting at the station waiting for the cops to do something. Ugh. Can you describe Maybe. your car? Yeah, it's got four wheels, two <laughs> doors. It's kind of gold. It's a sedan. Eh, you're going to have to be a little more specific. What was... It was stolen by a surfer dressed as a pirate. Come on. <laughs> you're going to have to be more specific than that. Damn it. <laughs> was, was there a shotgun behind the wheel? <laughs> Um, but yeah, so that that's kind of you know where the movie ends. Um, and it, all right, before we get into the the fun stuff, let, let's talk about the cast real quick because we've we've danced around it a little bit. But um, it's a pretty good cast for a slasher movie, if you ask me. Yes, absolutely. I think I mean for for what this movie could have turned into. Um, you know, I'm not going to say the the acting's Oscar worthy by any stretch of the imagination, but for what you would expect from a one million dollar 1981 slasher um, that barely played in 500 theaters back in '81, uh, I think they did a great job. Yeah, I think Linda Blair's. You know, it, this is kind of right before she did the uh, the the uh, centerfold, not centerfold, but the pictorial. That's the word I'm looking yeah. for for we magazine we and not w-e-e -E, uh but o-u-i yeah. what's funny too is that she she did, she tried to she did that photo from from what i found online she did that photo shoot to try to get out of doing genre films she wanted to like get out of the the young damsel in distress role and try to play like sexier roles and whatever but it kind of backfired on her because she never really got too many triple a titles after that you know she was kind of relegated to b movies and even later on like b action movies like i remember her starring in a 
um, late 80s action movie with, um, what's his name, Dirk Benedict from the A-Team. Mm -hmm. uh, the movie was called Ruckus. It's, it's a, just a terrible action movie. It's one of those like Saturday afternoon movies you might catch on HBO or something. Um, but yeah, uh, that photo shoot definitely did her a disservice. And dating, um, what do you call it, Rick James probably doesn't help your career much either. No, 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 no. <laughs> or just your personal life in any way. And Yeah. <laughs> you know, the thing that's interesting, I don't know if, if it's sort of, you know, causality or whatever that, like, I don't know that the spread helped or harmed her career necessarily. It, I, I don't think it helped. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that it hurt it because yeah, it's just the nature of Hollywood and making movies sure. and that kind of thing of like, if you've got a lane, it, it's the reason Bruce Campbell never became a bigger star. You know, it, it he was just a genre guy and th those are the roles he was offered and he was really good in those roles. And outside of Sam Raimi throwing him in Spider-Man and that kind of stuff and the new you know, Doctor Strange movie and that kind of stuff. Um, that all Sam Raimi, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it. You know, he was he was supposed to be Dark Man, and and that got shot down. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it and other directors just didn't give him that triple A shot. And I think Linda Blair was kind of in the same boat where, you know, she was a child actor. She was really good and the exorcist but then as time went on she was kind of a scream queen and that's what she was and that was her lane mm -hmm. and nobody really gave her a lot of opportunities to break out of that which is a shame yeah um but but she's good in this and and particularly towards the end of the movie i think uh you know when she's having to do that damsel in distress stuff she's good at doing that um and also having the kind of pluck you know i I don't know that she supplants Jamie Lee Curtis in my heart, but you know, you can tell that yeah. she's got a lot of pluck and that kind of thing. And it's, yeah, she's good. And, uh, you know, v actually Vince Van Patten, I think is really fun and, and yeah. silly and over the top and the kind of thing you need in this. I mean, he's basically playing himself a California surfer. <laughs> right. I mean, wh why not cat? Right. The, the, yeah. If you cast it right, you, you don't have to ask that much of your actor. And, go. and he's good and I, I feel the same way about Peter Barton I don't think mm -hmm. he's exceptional in this but I, as far as being that square jawed good looking lead yes totally fine I mean, he, you know if you look back at his career you see that he did a lot of soap operas and he's got that look he, he definitely has that male you know this the, the square like you said the squared off jaw you know big blue eyes look of a soap opera star but um, actually, I mean, I, I am a big fan of Peter Barton because he stars in my favorite slasher of all time. And it is not Hell Knight, mind you. It is, of course, Friday the 13th, the final chapter. Um, doesn't have a big role in it. You know, dies in the shower by getting his head crushed. You know, nothing too major. But um, anyone that's in that movie, I, I tend to follow because, you know, I, I uh, unapologetically call that movie my favorite slasher of all time yes halloween is great black christmas all the staples but it just for me the final chapter kind of it hit all the check marks for me i absolutely love it so yeah yeah no it's real good <laughs> that is a real good slasher yeah uh i don't know that's my favorite it's real good um yeah <laughs> yeah where's the corkscrew <laughs> The, the addition of Crispin Glover is such a wild card in that movie, and it makes oh. everything, like, half a star better in it's every true. scene he's in. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, his dance, I'm sorry. I Make fun of it all you like. I think it's goddamn spectacular. Yeah. I put it up, I put it up there with Ed Harris's dance in Creepshow. <laughs> I, right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Oh, and I love both those movies, and I love both these actors. So I, I, I don't know. I guess I'm kind of a cheese ball. Yeah. Oh <laughs> man. Now, I, yeah. All right. I, I, I need a super cut of just those things on a loop. <laughs> if you can somehow make it look like they're dancing together, we have that technology, oh. people. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so we talked about Su uh, Suki Goodwin, who did not do another feature besides this, but I, I, I think she's totally fine 
in this film. Yeah, I mean, for what it is, you know, you know, she's got that cool, she's got that cool accent. Obviously, has a great body, very cute face. I mean, it works. You know, it, you know, her role didn't wasn't exactly like the most. Um, it didn't call for a whole lot of range or anything like that. I mean, I, I thought she did fine. I, I didn't roll my eyes at any of her line deliveries, so that's a plus. Yeah, right, right. It, for her being the sort of second female lead of a movie called Hell Knight, totally fine. Um, and I genuinely like uh, Kevin Brophy as Peter Bennett, the fraternity yes. president. He is... Uh, smarmy and kind of a dick and a little too full of himself but also does the fear stuff pretty well um, he's just good he's a good actor in this and um, yeah. it, it's it's fun to see uh, you know this actor like who wasn't in a ton of other stuff I mean he was no, no. but it, all kind of B movies uh, he was I mean, he actually what's funny is that uh this movie has one person who stars in my favorite slasher of all time kevin brophy actually stars in my favorite western of all time that being 1980s the long riders oh, um man. it's a very obscure western but it ends with one of the most epic gunfights ever i absolutely love it but yeah this movie's great because there's a lot of like real life um brothers in it like randy and dennis quaid are both in it um who else there's a couple of other brothers that i can't think of off the top of my head but yeah if you ever get a chance folks and you like westerns uh the long riders you could, you could do a lot worse oh so check it out. there's three carradines in it yes that's right carradines yes oh christopher guest is in that dude there is a lot of people in that movie it is it is a very underappreciated western lynch maybe maybe westerns weren't very popular in 1980 but uh, look at watching it now uh, over the years anyway I, I I love it more and more every time I watch it it is such a great underrated film yeah that uh, that it's a hell of a cast James and Stacy Keach James Remar mm -hmm. is bouncing around in that thing yep. which makes sense it's a Walter Hill movie and yeah <laughs> you know James Remar is a a, a staple of Walter Hill films uh, Ajax <laughs> oh man he's such a jerk in that movie uh, yeah right oh he's such a scumbag yeah I, I mean his fate is the best just getting handcuffed to a police yep. bench and <laughs> left to go about his business if, if you don't know what we're talking about people you need to get your eyes on the warriors which is a mm. terrific film mm. um can you dig it um I mean, that's almost required viewing it really is it's one of those yep. movies like if you want to understand 80 cinema the, like the Warriors wasn't super popular at it at the time of its release, but it was incredibly influential. Yep. And and it's still an amazing movie when you watch it now. And don't get the director's cut with no, the animated no. stuff. No, no. Watch the the original theatrical cut of that movie, and it's all like I wonder if George Miller was like, all right, I need to do another Mad Max movie. What if I just do the Warriors? with uh you know women escaping from immortan joe because it's essentially the same thing it's like we're gonna go to a place find out that things are fucked up and then we're gonna go home and that's the whole movie uh but it's yeah uh, loosely loosely based on the story of the 300 spartans yeah very yes very loosely based but yeah. <laughs> um but th that opening uh the the whole opening speech about like you know, here's how many people uh, are in gangs. Here's how many police there are. You know, we outnumber them 20 to 1. We can carve up this city for ourselves. It's so good. And I, I'm going to forget his name. The the uh, Is it James Patrick Kelly? Is that his name? The, the guy who, you know, notably is the one who says, Warriors, come out and play. Oh, right. Yeah, he was on Twin Peaks, too. I think. Yeah, that, that he was... He, he was in the crow he was the guy you know there's no coming back there's no coming back like that guy he plays such a wonderful shit heel and he is creepy and wonderful and crazy in the warriors it's so good anyway if you haven't seen it yeah, <laughs> you gotta watch the warriors um, david patrick kelly yeah yeah, yeah. um <laughs> oh i was so close um anyway so that's a cast totally solid cast um mm -hmm. 
here here we get into maybe the briefest topic of the evening which is the themes of the film <laughs> and uh i mean I, I don't know believe believe your local legends uh. i yeah right <laughs> like what okay so t- t- i've been reading men women and chainsaws recently mm-hmm. and so for lack of the movie itself having like a lot of subtext i will sort of you know paraphrase what uh men women and chainsaws has to say about slasher heroines notably marty who is uh linda blair's character in this movie and is name checked in that book a number of times is used as an example of the slasher heroine and i I'll bring this up and then, you know, respond to it however you want. I There are things I agree with in Men, Women, and Chainsaws. There are things I don't agree with. But I like reading kind of critical thought about horror films because I spend so much time watching them. I want to feel like I'm not wasting that time. <laughs> and, and, you know, somebody smart being like, no, no, no. There's actually, you know, some interesting, uh, like, gender dynamics and things like that. Mm-hmm. So in hell night in particular marty is uh is is representative of a couple of things one there is this sort of as as the final girl becomes the final girl you know becomes uh, a character that can stand up for herself and so forth that even from the beginning there's sort of a blurring of the feminine and the masculine with the character because Marty, first of all, her name is Marty, which is a kind of an androgynous name. Yeah, but she uh, she doesn't like using her real name, which is Martha. Uh, you will not see that anywhere in the movie or anywhere in any of the credits. I had to go digging through a uh, copy of the original script to actually find Martha Gaines in there. <laughs> yeah, go figure. And there's the the bit about her. Uh, being a mechanic and and it's basically subverting the idea of what is typically feminine and so by the end of the movie you know she's she is doing taking on the rather masculine role of being the hero or at least a role that is traditionally masculine in action movies and dramas and and in most most films of the time you know the the man was the hero and that's one of the things that makes slashers kind of unusual but it's not just that she is a purely feminine character who is the the hero of the movie. She is a female character that has decidedly masculine traits. And so that she's not purely feminine, that she's more androgynous. Um, but that allows the male viewer, because horror movies are mostly watched by men, you know, statistically speaking, that that allows the male viewer to both identify with her and and root for her because there is an element of the familiar in that character that if she were a purely feminine character she would be less relatable it is part of the point of uh, men women and chainsaws or or just that because we need our heroes to behave a certain way and that way is traditionally masculine you have to kind of blend the feminine and masculine into your heroic character Mm. i mean i guess i mildly agree ultimately though a a final girl no matter how feminine she is is killing someone at the end of the film she is killing the you know the antagonist of the film killing in and of itself is a macho you know masculine activity Mm -hmm. you know women even though there have been plenty of female serial killers over the years and female soldiers and everything else it's still kind of considered a, you know, kind of a male centric thing to kill another human being. So, I mean, even though they make a point of, you know, saying that she, you know, maybe doesn't come from the most privileged background and that she actually is, you know, a child of a mechanic, I personally never really saw that as uh, making her more masculine. If, if anything, I, I found her more attractive because of it. You know, I mean, because there's something to be said about a woman who looks like a model, but then is also handy. 
you know that there's a lot to be said about a woman like that and uh for sure (laughs) yeah carol clover who who wrote the book and you know men women and chainsaws is about 30 years old at this point a little over 30 years old as a matter of fact and i think carol clover admits now that like a lot of the stereotypes used and a lot of the freudian thinking of men women and chainsaws is a little outdated at this point and might have even been a little simplistic even then because like she's very clearly cherry picking some like characters in movies to sort of make her larger point but i don't say that to dismiss everything that she says it's just that you know i it, like I said, I find it interesting to read a critical academic study of horror films, even sure. if I don't necessarily agree that, like, oh, every conclusion is right. But it, you know, I, I'm a believer in that argument that, like, oh, if you if you are able to argue your point um, or hearing a differing point of view, it, it helps you kind of crystallize your thoughts about a thing to some degree. Um, sure. But I uh, I agree with you though that I think most guys if you if if they're being honest will tell you that oh yeah I mean we all want somebody somebody that's attractive like that's just you know being an animal is wanting an attractive mate but that only goes so far and at the end of the day you want somebody that's kind of cool <laughs> and I, and I would imagine I, I would imagine this author probably wrote the book thinking about men of a certain age watching these movies you know because how often are you going to talk about 50 year old men watching slashers no you're, you're talking about guys in their 20s maybe even younger you know sneaking into a theater or, or or in my case watching this with an older cousin or whatever but yeah she's definitely not thinking about the older men that potentially could be watching these movies and you yeah know, i know that I, I know that's not the norm so so i i'm not going to argue necessarily with the points that she made but at the same time, I would have to question how big was her segment of people that she interviewed or researched or whatever, you know. So. Yeah, it was a lot of, like, there was a sample taken from uh, one town and then also some kind of apocryphal stories as well of, you know, mm-hmm. people that worked in video stores of like, okay, well, you know, let me ask somebody who works at a video store who is renting these movies sure. and that kind of thing. So, um, but yeah, it's still... You know, and and by no means am I suggesting that Carol Clover is, you know, bad mouthing horror movies. In fact, like she admits early on in the book, like I'm, I actually became a fan of these movies. But it's really interesting to think about them in terms of gender, even if, like I said, I think some of it's a little simplistic. Um, but it's interesting, and uh, for lack of anything else to talk about thematically with hell night <laughs> i just had to bring it up because uh, i happen to be reading it right now and then you know i'll when uh uh i finally get around to talk about poltergeist i'll bring it up again and talk about her views of possession films um <laughs> but um anyway i mean i don't want to steal any thunder anything else that you think of that is critical to a thematic discussion of this film Oh God, not really. No, I mean, uh, bowing to peer pressure, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, because you know, we, we, it's Hell Night, so it's obviously a kind of a collegiate rite of passage, if you will. So, um, you know, that the, the, I get. I mean, if you really, really dig deep, 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 you could kind of pull out some stuff about peer pressure and societal pressure and things like that. But I mean, it, it, it's going to be a pretty minor conversation, regardless. Fair enough. All right, let's get to the meat of this then, and let's talk about final thoughts and a rating. Uh, as always, it's a five star scale. Uh, we do allow half stars here, no quarter stars because we're not monsters. Um, so, uh, take it away. Like, what? What? It, where do you land with this movie at the end of the day? Okay, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, um, this is an absolute guilty pleasure for me. It is an imperfect film. I I can see that as an adult. I may have missed it as a 12-year-old watching it for the first time, but now I can definitely see its imperfections. I mean, hell, you can see the you can see a boom mic in the scene where uh, Seth is, um, you know, emulating surf surfing in the bed. The <laughs> boom mic actually enters the shot briefly there. So I mean, that you know, stuff like that tells you. 
you know, what kind of budget these people are working with, what kind of experience these people had. Because I think this director, this was only like his second feature, uh, non-adult video feature, of course. Um, which that was a point I kind of wanted to make earlier, too, that this director comes from adult film. And yet this is like the cleanest horror movie when it comes to sexuality I've ever seen. I couldn't believe it. Yeah, yeah. And isn't a lot of... Hold on, let me let me double check my math on this. But if memory serves, it's a lot of gay porn. Oh, was it? I didn't actually research it that deeply, and uh, maybe I'm glad I didn't. <laughs> let, hold on, All right, keep going, and I I will confirm or deny. Okay, so yeah, as I said, I mean, this movie is an imperfect film, but if you watch it, you know, at the right time under the right mindset, it might resonate with you. You might end up hating it too, ultimately. And anybody who says this movie is like just a piece of garbage, I'm not going to argue with them. I'm not going to try to convince them that, oh no, there's merits here that you're just not seeing. Ultimately, I saw this movie at the right time. It resonated with me. I've loved it ever since. So I've been watching this movie for what, over four, 41 years now. I've been watching this film and still love it. I was one of I was first in line to get that Scream Factory Collector's Edition when it was released. I, 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 I can't say enough positive things about the film, even though most people may not agree with me. Ultimately, um, nothing about the movie is really exceptional. I mean, I guess you could make an argument for the set design, um, but you know, for the most part, you know, it's a fairly forgettable score. Um, you know, the, the acting is okay to good at best. Um, even some of the editing is kind of choppy. I'm not sure if it was because of the transfer. For those who don't know, when you buy, when you get that Scream Factory Collector's Edition Blu-ray of this, there's actually a little bit of a PSA before the film starts letting you know that they weren't able to find a good um, original transfer of the film. That uh, basically that what we're holding in our hands here is just a copy of a work uh, not even a work print of a print that actually went out to theaters so it's basically a theater print that was probably played lord knows how many times depending on how long it played in theaters and you can kind of tell there's a couple of scenes in here with some tearing you've got some lines going of you know horizontal horizontally top to bottom across the screen um you've got some wobbly audio at times i know at times it's intentional but at other times it just it just doesn't sound intentional it sounds like there's a little bit of just, uh, you know, because back then they were putting their audio. To, uh, I'm sorry, folks. I'm bringing a lot of like film lab stuff because I actually have worked in the industry. So in the 80s, most audio was recorded on quarter inch tape. So you've got like quarter inch tape reels that you're trying to mix this audio from. So I can imagine that the task of remastering this was a very daunting task for the folks at Scream Factory. Um, but unfortunately, like I said, you're not getting that beautiful transfer that we always wanted. It's still probably the best the film has ever looked, but, you know, it's it's not a 4K UHD by any stretch of the imagination. Anyway, back to the film. Um, an imperfect film that tickles me every time, but because I have a little bit of a history watching Vince Van Patten on poker television shows, it, it kind of, you know, adds a little bit of extra guilty pleasure for me getting to see this guy that I now know as a fairly you know well-spoken debonair adult but to see him here as like a california surfer is you know it's fairly entertaining um though i do want to try to be as objective as possible with my rating ultimately you know if i was rating this on guilty pleasure it's a five out of five i just love this film i i could watch it any day of the week i could watch i could take any scene separate from the film and just watch that and walk away content but I also understand that it is imperfect and a lot of people have had problems with it over the years. So to trying to be as objective as I possibly can, balancing my cinephile eyes along with my, you know, uh, just guilty pleasure, love. And of course, you know, I'm kind of biased because of Linda Blair. As I said, she was my first horror crush. Um, we are, she's, she's what, she's like 10 years older than me. So yeah, when I saw her in The Exorcist, at about 10 or 11 years old, I fell in love and that has never gone away. I actually met her a couple of years ago, right before the pandemic at Monster Palooza out here in, in Pasadena. Uh, I met her as a 59 year old and my friends, I am still in love with her. Um, so nothing has changed and I, I like that. So I'm gonna come in with a respectable 3.5 out of five. Like I said, just trying to balance being objective and absolutely adoring this film, you know, as a, um, you know, 
kind of a, I, I wouldn't even say gore hound, but slasher hound, especially in the 80s. Like, I'm not as into slashers today. It's not a, a subgenre that I gravitate towards, but in the 80s, slashers were king. And this was just one of many that, you know, turned me into the horror hound that I am now. So, yeah, I'll stop rambling. 3.5 out of 5. Excellent. All right. Well, let's do a little bit of fact checking here. Tom DeSimone, director of Hell Knight, did in fact do a number of uh, gay porn movies featuring titles like How to Make a Homo Movie, <laughs> <laughs> Confessions of What's a... that about? Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, Confessions of a Male Groupie. Uh, there's Eroticus, a history of the gay movie. Uh, one of my favorite, Sons of Satan. Uh, really? That's a gay porn. Fun. Yeah. Uh, the, the synopsis of that is a man searching for his brother finds that he has joined a cult of devil worshiping gay vampires. Huh. You know, uh, how's that not a cult classic? <laughs> right. My, all right. My actual favorite title for his, uh, erotic, uh, oeuvre is six card stud. And I don't, I don't think you need a, a synopsis for that one to know what you're getting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I come down in, in very similar to you. Like I said, the upfront, the, this movie means a lot to me in a lot of ways. I credit this movie with inspiring me to write because I got so enamored with some of the ideas in the movie that I was like, I've got to figure out how to write what I'm thinking about in my head about this movie. And uh, I owe the movie uh, quite a bit for that. I, I, I saw it early and it, 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 it mattered to me. And I do think that all the gothic stuff looks really good. I think the fact that, you know, there's sort of this costume party vibe to the whole thing uh, makes it a little bit more than, say, a Friday the 13th 3, where it's just like, okay, here's some more campers and here's some more deaths. And, oh, by the way, there's some 3D. Um, this seems interesting. It's trying to do something with it. I don't think it's always successful uh, watching it now. Uh, same kind of caveat supply about the the Scream Factory edition, which I think is great and it's loaded with features and I enjoy the commentary and all that stuff. But the movie still only looks so good, uh, despite the fact that I do like a lot of the, the cinematography in it. Um, guy, by the way, a guy named Mac Alberg. Uh, did the cinematography who was also the cinematographer on reanimator mm -hmm. and from behind from beyond so did some uh uh Stuart gordon stuff that i like a whole lot um so but yeah i think at the end of the day i land in the same place ratings wise where i'm like you know as a hometown favorite it's it's like a four four and a half star movie realistically it's like, eh, it's a, like three and a half. Like, I still recommend it to people. If you've never seen it, it's, there. there's a real goofy charm to the movie. And and also, the violence with which uh, the killer dies at the end of this movie still kind of freaks me out. Like, it's a really good, you mm -hmm. know, like, thrashing on the end of a spike that I, I, <laughs> I find somewhat disturbing. So, um, yeah, it's it's not good but it's kind of great <laughs> perfect way to put it <laughs> um all right well before i cut you loose it is time to uh to, to look at three things that you may not know about uh this here movie um hell night and you probably know this stuff because mm -hmm. you do research like i do but uh i like this stuff so, uh, as you pointed pointed out, uh, one of the uh, the Gars, there were uh, two guys named Valentino Richardson and Chad Butler. Um, they are they were both German uh, who spoke little to no English, and that uh, as, as pointed out, uh, one of them died. Um, you know, in between this movie being finished and being released. Um, but I think it's interesting that not only are they completely uncredited in this movie, um, that you, like you said, you have to dig to find the names of them at all. Uh, but 
uh, we believe it is Valentina Richardson and Chad Butler. So, you know, <laughs> maybe that's who was in this movie, which is also a thing I kind of like, um, that there is no sure way to tell. Um, so, uh, Vince Van, pa- Van Patten uh, has made a claim that Kevin Costner was a grip on this movie. Now, he does not appear in the credits anywhere, uh, but that is the rumor, and I choose to believe it. <laughs> and one of the reasons I choose to believe it is because Frank Darabont of Green Mile fame was also a production assistant on this movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, not to mention, and this is just a, a catch-all for people that you may not have realized were involved with this movie... One of the producers was uh, Chuck Russell. The, I think it's his first executive producer credit. And uh, Chuck Russell, of course, went on to do uh, Nightmare on Elm Street 3. Um, he directed the Blob remake, which is fantastic. He did The Mask. He did Eraser, which is not very good. Uh, but, I mean, he's been around making movies forever and ever and ever, has written a bunch of stuff, directed a bunch of stuff, and this was one of his early, early roles, or uh, as a uh, behind-the-scenes kind of cast, uh, not cast, but um, crew uh, in executive producing this movie. Um, also pointing out Dan Wyman, who did the music for this movie, who was composer on this movie was composer on a movie called without warning that I have a lot of time for. (laughs) Ah, flying barbed vaginas. Oh, I love it so much. (laughs) That movie is ridiculous. And, uh, but, but terrific actors in it. Yeah. Another movie that doesn't deserve the cast it has. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Like there are Oscar award winners in that movie. Yes. And that is not correct. Um, but he, so he also did, uh, in addition to Without Warning and Hell Knight, also did the soundtrack to The Lawnmower Man. Yeah, I'll forgive him. Sure. But the thing <laughs> I find interesting about uh, about him as a, a musician is he worked under John Carpenter. That's where he kind of cut his teeth uh, doing Halloween and The Fog um, with Carpenter. Mm-hmm. And so when you listen to the soundtrack to Hell Knight, you can hear that John Carpenter influence. Absolutely. There's multiple scenes with some dark synth uh, playing in the background. Yeah. And even some like music stings that Mm -hmm. are very Carpenter-esque. It's really interesting. Um, And then the last thing after that catch all of here's a bunch of people that were involved in this movie. Um, the, the guy who played Peter uh, in the movie, Kevin Brophy, said that uh, the purple cape that he wore in this film, um, <laughs> he still got it. <laughs> and says that he has worn it every ding-dong Halloween since making <laughs> Hell Knight. Uh, things got to be in terrible shape. <laughs> Probably so, but I, uh, I respect it. I like oh, it. Oh, absolutely. Um, well, man, look. It is always a delight. It has been far, far too long. We will not, we will not let this much time pass again. Yes, definitely. Uh, but I, I thank you so much. And more importantly, um, where can people hear more out of you as they will likely want to do? All right. Well, my main home is the No More Room in Hell uh, feed. Uh, basically, if you subscribe to the No More Room in Hell feed, you will get all three of my shows. They are, uh, of course, the main show, No More Room in Hell, which is a bi-monthly um, kind of... Uh, we try not to do like the most commonplace horror films in there. We try to pull some you know oddball stuff out there like you know if you want to hear a review of nightmare on elm street we're not the place to go but if you want to hear a review of a 1970 czechoslovakian horror film <laughs> called valerie and her week of wonders then we're the show for you so yeah check us out there on the dark discussions podcast network and and then the other two shows under the same banner are no more room in hell presents fresh cuts that is our weekly show where we review the newest releases in the genre Our latest episode covers the latest release from Shudder called Night's End. It is a supernatural haunted house film that has a kind of a uh, a social media tinge to it for those who haven't seen it. So it's um, it's currently available. 
it's a, it's it's yeah it, it's kind of a i hate to say it but it's it's kind of a subpar version of 2020's host if anybody remembers that film also from shutter yeah um so yeah it's kind of, it's you know I, i'm not gonna say it's like not worth your time at all but i mean if you like supernatural stuff and you like some cheesy effects and cheesy creature design yeah check it out it, it, it's not the worst thing you've ever seen I'm, and then the final show. Oh, go ahead. No, I just because I haven't talked to anybody else who's seen this movie yet, and I got to get this uh -huh. off my chest. I I felt like there was a weird tonal shift in that movie, where oh, yeah. like the front end of it, I was like, oh, this is this kind of somber, haunted house. Mm -hmm. Like the guy's got social anxiety and all this stuff is going on, and you know, sort of reflective of the pandemic and et cetera, et cetera. And then all of a sudden, it just gets super goofy. <laughs> And I was like, I, I've got whiplash. I was not ready for this this turn. Yeah, it definitely does a a malignant type tonal change where you know for the first two acts it's one movie, and then for the third act it's like something completely different that you weren't expecting. But you know sometimes it's a good thing, as in malignant, and sometimes it's not so great. But uh, I'll let you guys make the decision on night ends. Um, ultimately, I didn't hate the film. Um, I just feel like if 2020's host wasn't a thing, I might have liked this one a little bit better. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, sorry to interrupt, but I, I just, I had to stop you there. No, no, not at all. Uh, and then the third show um, in the family is No More Room in Hell presents Creature Comforts. That is the newest show in the family. That is, of course, a creature feature review. That is a monthly show that I do with Mr. Don and Nelly from the Horror Countdown podcast and Mr. Derek B from the Cinema Attack show. Um, and funny that we get to this point, segue um, on our next episode, which will be episode eight, your, your uh, illustrious host of the Dark Parade, Mr. Bo Ransdell, will be joining us as we review The Relic, um, which I haven't watched since it was released. And I don't even remember what I thought of it when I watched it. So this is practically going to be a, a first time watch for me. I know I saw it in theaters, but I just, I can't remember for the life of me what I thought of it walking out of the theater. So, yeah. which may be a good sign or may not be a good sign. We'll have to see, but yeah, uh, we'll be checking that out. So look for that. I believe uh, we'll be recording at the end of this month. Uh, episode will probably be out last week of april or maybe within the first couple of days of may once again all those can be heard on the dark discussions podcast network and unfortunately most of my other shows are on extended hiatus right now um in the mic of madness is on hiatus because my co-host is actually a presence in the independent film industry um she produces writes and directs uh films she's currently promoting her latest film called uh, tin roof um, and that is uh, Rebecca Reinhardt, of course, for anybody who listens to that show. So um, that's one that's on an hi extended hiatus. Uh, my other show that's on an extended hiatus, and this one kind of breaks my heart a little bit more, is Underwater Kaiju from Outer, Outer Space that we do um, with Mr. Jerry Herring from, the, from Kill the Cast right here on the Legion Podcast Network. Um, unfortunately, you know, Jerry's had some life situations occur and we have not been able to put an episode together in you know phew, close to 10 months now it seems um so yeah hopefully fingers crossed that'll be back sooner than later anyone who knows me knows how much i love my kaiju films godzilla gamera i mean i could i could talk about them for days on end so that's that's the one hiatus that's kind of been breaking my heart lately but obviously we i i now have creature features to kind of fill in that or creature comforts excuse me uh, to kind of fill in that gap, but out of respect to Jerry, we are avoiding kaiju films on that show until Underwater Kaiju is officially dead. If that ever happens, then you'll start seeing us review kaiju films on Creature Comforts, because I mean, that was part of the reason I created the show to begin with. Um, but yeah, so uh, unfortunately, you're not going to hear me on, you know, 11 different podcasts anymore. Um, on top of the fact that I have a new job that I was talking to Bo about, you know, uh, before we started recording, that's taking up a lot of my time. Hence why we had to record this episode a little bit later than we normally would. But um, yeah, so I'm still I'm still trying to plug away at podcasting while still trying to build my career and still trying to get as much poker in as possible. Anybody who knows me knows I am a voracious poker player. So um, and that's about it for me, Bo. Well, that doesn't sound like nearly enough. Um, so we'll we'll do this again real soon. Uh, I, in fact, 
I'll, I'll, t- I'll talk to you offline about this, but uh, I, I think I got something to, to tempt you. Um, nice. <laughs> all right. Uh, I'll, I'll shut up uh, at this moment. And so, listeners, uh, stick around because then I'll be not shutting up in just a second to close the show. And that is, of course, my conversation with Venom about Hell Knight. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed it. I had a great time talking about that movie with him. That movie is strangely important to me, uh, but it is no use to look backwards. It is time to look ahead uh, into May and see what awaits us there. May is going to be a month where we talk about movies that uh, exist above and below the waves. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what to call it. Usually about halfway through the month, I realize, oh, there's a, a good pithy name for this thing that I'm doing. and and But then I forget all about it. So, <laughs> uh, for now, it is just uh, Aquatic Horrors, something like that. If you have a suggestion, let me know. Um, speaking of letting me know, you can always hit me up uh, on Twitter. I'm at Dark Parade Pod. Uh, over on Facebook, there's a Facebook group for uh, the Dark Parade. If you just search for the Dark the Dark Parade under Groups, you'll find it there. Or you can just email me. Um, and you can do that at Bo, that is B-O at legionpodcasts.com. Uh, if you have comments, concerns, uh, I am not on the other social media channels with any kind of regularity, so it would just be unfair to tell you to contact me there. Or if you want, I'm going to try to remember to start including the Discord server in the notes. So if you look at the show notes and use Discord, you can find me there. And Discord, I'm on all the time because of work and any uh, number of other reasons. Uh, it's just the one I, I tend to use the most. So that'll do it for this month of Slashers. We've got the the Aquatic Horrors ahead, starting uh, with Orca, the Killer Well. And we are going to be bringing on a, uh, a new guest host for that one. So I'm very excited about that as well. Uh, next month is going to be a lot of fun. A lot of different guests, a lot of different movies, different kinds of movies. Uh, there, there's a real wild card in the mix. And uh, I'm, I'm excited to talk about that as well as some personal favorites of mine. So it's going to be a great time. Always uh, more Heart of Horror with Kay Pollock, more What You Watching with Jamie and Bo, more Found Footage Fool. And uh, as I've threatened before, um, I'm getting ever closer to having the time to really dig in to uh, do some kind of interesting side project stuff. And so probably that is going to begin rolling out in June. So keep an eye out for that. Um, that is it for this time. I appreciate you rating and reviewing where that is possible. That, uh, helps a lot. If you listen to this over on YouTube, uh, which is youtube.com forward slash Legion podcast, uh, be sure you, you click the thumbs up on the video that helps, uh, visibility as well. And as always, thank you for joining the dark parade. We'll see you next time. <laughs>